And your uh, last year. No, wonderful. Mm -hmm. We have uh, tremendous assets here at the uh, at the University of Washington. Young people coming up through. Um, she was just featured as one of the three, the triumvirate: uh, Sarah Tuttle, <laughs> Emily Levesque, and uh, Jessica in the Scientific America last month. So. Uh, uh, give her kudos for that, and many other women that have come through University of Washington. It's a tremendous uh, progressive program as well. And uh, Jessica, if I'm not mistaken, does quite a bit of work uh, preparing students for outreach. And of course, that's in our blood as well. Uh, outreach is part of our blood. And so we communicate um, through the Theodore Jacobson and our public star parties and things like that. And she trains them, and then she says, go find something to do. And we say, here's something to do right here and they come to the Theodore Jacobs Center where star parties. So much more interesting things to talk about this evening. Galaxies is her gig, ionized gases and uh, galaxy formation and things like that. Um, it's wonderful to have her here this evening for just a few minutes. And I know uh, you'll be mesmerized by the topic as well. So just give her your best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. And is everybody able to see the slides on Zoom and not the notes? All right, great. Took us a while to get that sorted out. So um, it is a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't really uh, express that enough, how, how glad I am to be here and presenting to you. So, and this is my passion, right? And this talk is ultimately about the Cycling and recycling of the material in the universe, uh, most of which, the atomic material, baryonic material in the universe, most of which is in a gaseous state. And our kind of jargony term for this is the cosmic baryon cycle. Okay. And that's what I am going to, in the first part of this talk, give you a very broad overview of what I mean when I say cosmic baryon cycle and get you to appreciate the very vast, very violent journey that the individual atoms that make up your body and the air in this room that you breathe right now uh, have been on over the last 13.7 billion years of cosmic history. And then in part two, I'll talk about the actual observations that I make using the Hubble Space Telescope and other large ground-based telescopes that allow us to actually make these measurements and obtain the kind of constraints that I'll tell you about very broadly in the first part of the talk. So in the first part of the talk, you're just supposed to kind of sit back, relax, and appreciate just how vast and insane the universe is in both time and space. But in case you're the kind of person who falls asleep during talks, I'll tell you the main point right now. And so most of you have seen this t-shirt here. Maybe you've even worn a version of this t-shirt that very helpfully points out your location in the Orion spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, about eight kiloparsecs, or maybe, you know, 20,000 light years from the central supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And that's all nice and good. But somewhere between 3 billion and 9 billion years ago, the atoms in your body, the vast majority of the atoms on this planet, were way out here in this region of space we call the circumgalactic medium, the space outside of these beautiful spiral stellar disks of galaxies. So that's the main takeaway. So this is part one. And the title of this talk, Intergalactic Immigrants, uh, is actually inspired by a colleague of mine who runs these very large computer simulations, an image of which you see here. And this image is from this illustrious, gargantuan cosmological simulation that inputs all of the physics we know and runs on these supercomputers for years and ultimately tries to simulate things like galaxy formation in the universe. And so what you see here is this co vast cosmic web, this network of gaseous filaments that's connecting galaxies. And one of the key results from examining these simulations is that 
the vast majority of material even in a galaxy comes from other galaxies because galaxies are constantly colliding and interacting with each other. And so in a sense, when I say the vast majority of your atoms were once in the circumgalactic medium, the atoms in the circumgalactic medium came from other galaxies. So in a sense, all of the atoms in our body come from the intergalactic medium. But of course, really, I want to talk about the long journey that they've been on over this 13.7 billion years. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to get on the same page. So there's four key things that you're going to have to appreciate before I just start and continue yammering on about the cosmic baryon cycle. And so the first, I think, is one which you're all very familiar with, is that the universe tells its story mainly through light and the presence of light and these photons, right, that we collect with our eyes. And again, most of you know you love the unit light year, right? Uh, that light, of course, doesn't arrive instantaneously. It travels at the fastest possible speed, right, 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second. And so that means when you see the images on the screen, for example, it's less than a nanosecond to reach your eye. But, you know, the universe is so vast, right, that the light is significantly delayed through the vast gulfs of space that it has to cross to reach our eyes. And so in this sense, astronomy is kind of like ancient history. The further away objects are, the older the story they have to tell us. And so one of the things that first drew me to astronomy that captured my attention was when I was sitting in my first intro to astronomy class as a young undergraduate in college, and I learned that the sun, 93 million miles away, it takes eight and a half light minutes for the, that light to reach our eyes. And I was like, whoa, if the sun just fizzled out right now, we wouldn't know for eight and a half minutes, oh my God, and it freaked me out. But then it freaked me out even further that the nearest star to the sun is about four years. That's tens of thousands of light years in terms of light travel time. That our nearest galaxy then, think about these size scales, is then 2.5 million light years. And the most distant galaxies are almost 13 billion light years away. The universe is absolutely vast. And that's one of the things that first blew my mind and drew me to astronomy. But I think it's important to remember that as we consider some of the physics I'll tell you about. The next thing is something you already know, probably, but it's always fun to remind you. Atoms are the basic building blocks of normal matter. OK, I'm not talking about dark matter in this talk even, which is actually the vast majority of matter in the universe. But let's leave that for now and just think about normal matter made up of atoms, which consist of a nucleus and electrons. One cool fact about an atom that you might not appreciate is that it's mostly empty space. And for, you know, I, I like to make analogies in terms of size scales. And so if you want to picture an atom, picture this. A baseball, some of you are baseball fans. Mariners, go Mariners. Yeah. Um, all right, so if the nucleus of this atom, made of the protons and the neutrons, were the size of a baseball, then the electrons, the nearest electrons, would be a full football field away. Isn't that crazy? All right, but I think the main point I want to make about atoms is that most of the light we see in the universe, especially when we do spectroscopy, results from electrons changing their energy levels. And when they jump down in an energy level, they'll release a photon. Or sometimes a photon will hit them and they'll absorb a photon. And that's how we ultimately track material in the universe and atoms in the universe. This is what I do. I measure atoms in the universe. And I do that by measuring the light that comes from these electronic transitions way, way out in the boonies of these atoms. And speaking of counting atoms in space, I think the next point I want to make are the vastly disparate size scales that we're dealing with. And what I'm trying to do ultimately is to connect on the very smallest scales, these atoms, to structures on the very largest scales, this cosmic web, 
And so the size scales span more than 32 orders of magnitude. So if I just use meters here, an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters, one ten billionth of a meter. Whereas a galaxy halo, if you're just talking about a galaxy and all the gas surrounding it and its giant cocoon, is about 10 to the 22 meters. And then for reference, to just try to appreciate this on a human size scale, right? You, your size scale, two meters, or maybe a meter, I don't know how tall people are. Anyway, uh, meter-ish scale, compared to the size of the entire Earth, that's about six orders of magnitude. So think of this, now we're dealing with way more, 26 additional orders of magnitude difference in terms of disparate size scale, but we can do it and it's amazing. Okay, and the last thing uh, to understand, to all get on the same page, is that not only are the size scales vast, but the universe contains multitude. And this right here is the original Hubble deep field, not the ultra deep field, which you find, and that's all great. I love the deep fields, they're incredible, but this is the original Hubble deep field. And I love this image because it has a beautiful story behind it too. It is, it was taken uh, over 10 consecutive days, just a deep stare. And it was taken because Bob Williams, who was the director of Space Telescope Science Institute at the time, decided with his director's discretionary time on this brand new Hubble Space Telescope in 1995 to point this telescope at nothing for 10 days. People were fighting over how to use it, what they wanted to point it at. They wrote these very detailed proposals to understand intricate physics. And Bob Williams said, you know what, I'm just gonna see what I see if I point it at nothing for 10 full days. And what he found was absolutely incredible. In this tiny field that you see here, which is the equivalent of a grain of rice held at an arm's length. You wanna hold that up to the ceiling. That's the size of the field on the sky. There's over 3,000 galaxies. Each, almost every single point of light in this image is a galaxy. There's a couple stars. See if you can see them. They've got little diffraction spikes on them. So some of you might be able to pick them out. But by and large, there are 3,000 galaxies in this little field, right? And you can quickly do the math and ultimately end up with the fact that there are billions of galaxies in the observable universe. And each of these galaxies itself contains hundreds of billions of stars. Each of these stars probably are surrounded by planets with moons and light that can think about and comprehend their place in the universe. And that's something that I absolutely just love to appreciate. So when we're talking about galaxies here and atoms, we're just, uh, I don't know, we're, we're talking about these not only huge size scales, but on these just multitudes of galaxies, billions. All right, so now that we're all on the same page, let's get back to those atoms. And let's get back to those atoms in our body. And when I think about the atoms in our body, what do I think about? Well, I don't know, I think about carbon and my muscles. I think about iron in my blood. I think about oxygen in the air that I'm breathing. And so the story you're about to hear is a cosmic story of absolutely epic proportions. So each individual atom in your body right now will be a part of your body for as little as a nanosecond to as long as about 30 years. And of course, they're not forged for your exclusive use. Uh, they've been all over the planet. They've been continually recycled. One of my favorite, absolute favorite exercises to illustrate the kind of planetary cycling of atoms is the following. So everybody bear with me right here and take a deep breath. Fill your lungs with air, maybe like a liter of air. Just feel it filling your lungs. All right, now let's think about the number of atoms in that single breath full of air. And let's make a comparison for the volume of air in your lungs to the entire Earth's atmosphere. So there are more atoms in that single breath full of air than there are breathfuls of air in the entire Earth's atmosphere. So I'll say that again. There are more atoms in that single breath full of air than there are breathfuls of air in the entire Earth's atmosphere. And so that means that it's very likely that that last breath you just drew in contains at least one atom in common with the first breath you ever drew 
as a human being on planet Earth. Absolutely astounding. You might have heard this in relation to like Julius Caesar. Every time you take a breath in, you breathe an atom that Julius Caesar breathed in. But I mean, same with you and yourself. Um, and so just as the atoms in the air that you have been breathing uh, have been cycling on planet Earth for you know, four and a half billion years or so, so have they been cycling for even greater billions of years, even more billions of years on the largest known scales. And they'll continue to cycle for billions of years into the future. And so first, our cosmic origin story begins 13.7 billion years ago or so. And so what you see here is the Planck image of the cosmic microwave background. These are temperature fluctuations in the very early universe. I'd like to think of this as a kind of uh, baby picture of the universe, right? And it's beautiful, isn't it lovely? Um, and so basically, you all probably know that at the very beginning, right, both space and time and matter were created in an incredibly dramatic event that we call the Big Bang, which was neither big nor did it make a bang, but that's the subject of a totally different talk. And even when the universe was three minutes old, so the early universe is so hot and so dense, it's like a nuclear furnace, like a star, right? And it can have its own fusion. And when the universe is three minutes old, it's cooled enough for uh, nuclei to form, for protons and neutrons to slam together and form atomic nuclei. And then it keeps cooling and cooling and atoms are formed, but the electrons can't quite attach to the atoms for 300,000 years. But in 300,000 years, those electrons get attached to those nuclei. And what's amazing is when that happens, the photons, which meanwhile have been scattering off of all of those electrons, no way out, no way to go. When those electrons finally cool and settle onto their atoms via the, the electromagnetic force, the photons, the light, can stream freely through the universe and reach our eye, and that's what this picture is. It's 300,000 years after the Big Bang, right when the first atoms form. And it's absolutely beautiful. And so what happens is the way that the universe cools early on, only helium, hydrogen, well, hydrogen, which is everything, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium form. And then the universe is cooled too much, nuclear fusion shuts down. So what about the other atoms? Right? What about everything else? Right? We're not just hydrogen and helium and trace light elements. How did the other 88 natural elements form? Most of them form in a process known as nuclear fusion, which happens in the cores of stars. And in fact, most, the most common heavier elements uh, form in the cores of very, very massive stars, like the carbon in your body. Most of you have probably heard the phrase, we are stardust, and that makes you, oh, you know, our atoms were formed in the cores of stars. We're made of stardust. That's great, but it's the only part of the story, right? Because those atoms have to get out of the stars, right? And that's kind of what I'm more interested in, is how do you go from being generated in the core of a star to getting out of the star? Here's my requisite slide on nuclear fusion. Um, if we go back to, say, the oxygen atoms, oxygen is probably my favorite element. You had to, you know, actually, there's a funny story about oxygen. Maybe I'll just tell you that for yeah. a minute. Um, so my first paper that I ever wrote uh, as a graduate student was about the abundance of oxygen in galaxies. And my mom really wanted to read it. She, you know, was a big fan. And she was proud that I had published this paper. And uh, she read the paper. And it's, of course, like astronomy, you know, jargon everywhere. She wasn't a physics major. She was an accountant. And she read the whole paper, and I sent it to her, and she said, all right, I think I get it, but I have one question. And I was like, wow, just one question. Okay, thanks, Mom, go ahead. And she said, oxygen is a metal? Anyway, so, uh, you know, that was, I thought that was great. So in astronomy, yes, oxygen is a metal because it's one of the heavier elements that ultimately is not formed uh, in the original Big Bang. And this is just showing you here, uh, the process by which carbon slams into each other and then carbon slams into helium to make oxygen in the cores of these massive star furnaces. But like I said, we care about how these atoms get out of the stars, right? Oh, and the images of how these atoms get out of the stars are some of my absolute favorite. And these massive stars, which are fusing all of these atoms that make up our air and our planet, right? They 
ultimately die very young. They live fast, they die young. Our star, like the sun, is gonna live 10 billion years. These massive stars live like 10 million years, okay? And what they do, ultimately, they fuse everything so fast, they collapse in on themselves. And what happens is there's a resulting shock wave that expels materials out into the universe, sweeps up material with it, right? This is called a supernovae, supernova. And uh, it leaves a black hole at the center. But meanwhile, all of its like entrails, all of the stuff that's made in its core gets spewed out into the galaxy's gaseous interstellar medium. So then, you know, the atoms are kind of moving rapidly away from that surrounding devastation. They're cooling off. They're emitting, as they're cooling off, right, those electrons are cascading down energy levels and the photons at specific energies are reaching our eyes. And we can take these gorgeous narrow band images of these uh, like stellar death throw nebulae. And anyway, these atoms drift in a turbulent interstellar medium, but like I said, they get out of galaxies too. And galaxies themselves, where there are hundreds of thousands of these massive stars ending their lives simultaneously in supernovae, can generate what are called huge, large-scale galactic winds. Does anybody know what galaxy this is here? This is one of my favorites. M82, yeah, Messier 82. And it's, you know, this is a multicolor image and includes x-rays and includes infrared and includes optical light. And this is literally from the stars at the center of the galaxy going supernova basically all at once, at least from the perspective of the galaxy, and just sweeping up the material in the interstellar medium and propelling it into the, inter the circumgalactic medium beyond. And so that's where I come in. I really love to study hard things. That's what I want to do. I want, I want a, a challenge. And understanding this material is incredibly hard because, because it's a lot of material. But like I said, these distances are really vast. They're spread over huge distances. So that means the density out here is super, super low. If you think about the density of air you're breathing right now, the density of gas in one of these nebulae that I show is about uh, a million times less dense. And then the density of gas in the circumgalactic medium is even a million times less dense than that. So you can't see it, and that's why I like it. It's invisible, it makes it really hard to study. And I'm gonna tell you how I study it, in just a second. But first, I think it's worthwhile to just go through how these atoms that are outside of galaxies ultimately come back into the galaxies, what's known as the recycling process. And what happens is eventually material cools, okay? And when I say cool, right, what'll happen is you're outside of the galaxy, no longer do you have that starlight heating you up, right? You're out in the cold confines of the galaxy, those electrons get a little less excited as they do that, they emit photons, that's cooling, and they cool down, and when they cool, they get condensed, and it's kind of like rain, they'll fall back down onto the galaxy. Sometimes we call it like precipitation, right, in galaxy formation models. And so you get what happens is stuff goes out, it cools down, and it comes back in. Some of it might leave entirely and go to another galaxy, but most of it, we think, comes back in. And then they're reincorporated into the interstellar medium, and when they are, they undergo yet another collapse, right? And this is the collapse associated with star formation. And the collapse won't destroy a star this time, it'll create a new one. And what happens is these gas clouds, right, get enough material that they start to be self-gravitating. And once they start to be self-gravitating, you know, they collect more and more material, the pressure from the gas can no longer support, it starts collapsing and uh, it heats up when it does this, and boom, a star is born. There's whole graduate level courses devoted to star formation, but uh, this is my little star formation uh, slide. But of course, the atoms in our bodies uh, didn't end up in the star. In fact, they ended up 93 million miles from the host star out in this debris, originally proto disk, right? Here's the proto sun right here. This is an artist's image. And 
it was, you know, this disc ended up being flattened, material slams into each other, and ultimately it goes from dusty to rocky over the course of several millions of years. And the atoms in our body end up bound to one of those big rocks that ends up about 93 million miles from the star. And of course, in the billions of years that they've been on this planet, the atoms in your body have been in the ocean, in the air that we breathe, They've been breathed by dinosaurs, Julius Caesar, even yourself, and they'll continue uh, to be part of the planet for billions of years more long after humans have walked the earth. All right, so that is part one, and that's the cosmic baryon cycle. Okay. And now I want to share with you how we actually, how I make these observations, okay? So this is my research program. I've been a PI, on approximately six uh, Hubble Space Telescope programs uh, to date. And uh, I'm gonna share what I think are some of the most, uh, their results primarily from about 2014, but I think that they're some of the most important results. And it's the kind of observations we make are very um, similar. So basically the circumgalactic medium, I think of it as like the beating heart of galaxy evolution, right? This is where the exciting processes are happening and you can't see it directly. So you have to devise these very clever experiments. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but ultimately what I do is I use the Hubble Space Telescope. I point it at really bright distant objects and look at how the light from that bright distant objects gets dimmed by stuff in front of it. And I look in specifically how certain photons are absorbed at certain energies and what different electronic transitions they correspond to in different atoms. I'll go through that though. But first, this is not only hard because it's incredibly low density, right? Like there's basically uh, 10, it's about one one thousandth of an atom per cubic centimeter. That's like, Nothing. I mean, that's less than nothing, right, by our own standards. But it's also really hard to observe because in the universe, the way that atomic physics works is that most of the electronic transitions that we want to observe happen in the ultraviolet. And you all probably appreciate our atmosphere, which is wonderful. It keeps us alive and it allows us to live on this planet. And it blocks ultraviolet photons for the most part. It's opaque to ultraviolet radiation. So almost every really interesting wavelength that we want to see is below about 3,400 angstroms, which is below this atmospheric cutoff. And so we have to go to space. So it's really low density. We have to go to space and we have to do these absorption line experiments. And so this is just kind of a slide that shows you different types of spectra you can take. I don't know how many of you have experience with spectroscopy. I know many of you are very talented uh, photographers, astrophotographers, um, but the spectroscopy I love. For me, people say like uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think it's kind of true of like a spectrum is worth a thousand images basically, maybe even more like a million. <laughs> um, but it basically just divides up to the light in its different energies, right? And you can see what's going on at very, very specific energies depending on your spectral resolution. And the kind of spectroscopy that I do for very, very thin clouds of gas, right, is I point my telescope at a hot light source, which I'll go into, and then what that produces is something like an absorption line spectrum in B uh, on this image. And what happens is that light passes through the gas. Some of the light is happening at energies very specific to some of the atoms in there where their electrons can transition at exactly those energies. And depending on the composition of the gas, you'll get this beautiful absorption line spectrum with patterns that correspond to different tr electronic transitions of different atoms. And so literally, when you measure these absorption lines here, you're measuring how much of a certain atom is there because it's the electronic transitions in that atomic cloud. Oops, okay. So, I don't use light bulbs. There are no light bulbs in space, but even better than light bulbs are quasars. Um, so they're nice because they can be seen over really vast distances. They're actually some of the most energetic, most intrinsically luminous objects in the entire universe. Uh, they emit 
So think of the whole Milky Way with its hundreds of billions of stars. They emit about a thousand times the energy of the whole Milky Way galaxy. And they're just coming from the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. It's a very active phase of that supermassive black hole. The Milky Way's supermassive black hole. Maybe you saw the image released recently from the EHT, right? It's not in a quasar phase. It might have been one day, though. In these quasar phase, we think that they're kind of short-lived, but they're incredibly energetic. But to me, what's really nice about them, too, is that intrinsically, not only are they luminous, but they emit a lot of light in the ultraviolet. And that allows you, one of the things you want when you're doing spectroscopy is you want something known as a really bright continuum. And so what you see here, that continuum is that kind of baseline. You see all those lines sticking up. Those are emission lines from the actual accretion disk around the black hole. But you see that continuum rising down toward about 200, you know, 150 nanometers there. Uh, it's really, really bright in the ultraviolet. And that's great because it makes a really nice continuum backdrop for the absorption lines I want to see. So I'm showing you this. This is a textbook kind of quasar spectrum here. Like I said, these emission lines come from the accretion disk. They're fascinating. Astronomers spend you know, decades trying to figure out what those emission lines mean and measuring those. I don't care about those emission lines. I'm into the absorption. You don't see any absorption lines here yet. You will in a second. But I just want to point out some features here. I think the one that I like uh, the most, or the one that's most prominent, is this Lyman alpha line at about 121 nanometers here. And it's useful to know, right, because the spectrum of hydrogen is really important in astronomy. Um, and that's because it is by far the most abundant element in the universe. And emission and absorption processes, both of them, happen in series. Uh, which are sequences of these lines where a photon gets emitted or absorbed, and each ends and begins with the same atomic state. And in the ultraviolet, it's called the Lyman series. And the strongest line in the Lyman series, this is uh, Lyman alpha, right, involves this transition. It's probably the strongest transition in all of the universe where the electron is going from, uh, you know, one excited state to the n equals one ground state level. So this is the most common transition. We see it's at 12, 16 angstroms, and it can happen in both emission and absorption when you absorb a photon with exactly 13.6 electron volts of energy, or at 121.6 nanometers. So here's the intrinsic spectrum of a quasar again, with that nice Lyman alpha emission. Here's what a spectrum really looks like of a quasar. This is a this is, they don't show you this in the textbooks, right? So there's a Lyman alpha emission line. It's not at 121.6 angstroms. Maybe you guys know why. It's because quasars are super distant and the universe is expanding. And because the universe is expanding, the light is getting redshifted, right? It, this is the Doppler shift of light. But also you'll notice here all these little lines that look like they're kind of going down to zero. Those, every single one of those are absorption lines. And they're absorption lines from gas in front of the quasar. Gas made of atoms of all varying kinds, most of which are hydrogen, but some of which are metal lines, right? And they're getting, they're absorbing photons from the quasar. And I love this visualization here. So I'm gonna play you, whoops, I think. I'm going to play you a video. Hold on. Oh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to play this video. So what you see in this video, uh, this is put together a visualization by Andrew Ponson. We've got our nice quasar spectrum here. We've got our hydrogen Lyman alpha line that we just talked about, the strongest emission line in hydrogen. And then a couple other lines are labeled. These are ions of carbon, silicon, another carbon, very highly ionized carbon line, uh, ionized iron line. And so what you're going to see is here's the quasar. And we're going to start moving away from the quasar, and that light is going to pass through gas. And first, what you're going to see is a bunch of hydrogen absorption in the series. But eventually, we're going to go through near a galaxy, and you'll start to see metals. So watch this build up. So every time we're going through a cloud, we get a new hydrogen series. But again, the light is redshifting, so it all gets shifted in this wavelength space from each other because we're moving away from the quasar. The universe is expanding. Boom, we just went through a galaxy. Look at all those beautiful metals. They're getting redshifted too. So each quasar spectrum is like this beautiful fingerprint of all of the stuff 
directly in front of it on its line of sight toward us. And it's amazing, like trying to sort out what each of these individual lines corresponds to, but we know what the inherent energies are so we can actually sort this out and measure you know, all of the material in front of the quasars for thousands of quasars to understand what's in the entire universe. And basically the reason that we're just starting to know about this is because of the installation of this new spectrograph on the Hubble Space Telescope in 2009. In 2009, an amazing thing happened. There was this resurfacing mission. They kept Hubble alive. Um, it's been one of the most productive telescopes for all of astronomy and it was failing. It needed uh, some new gyros and it needed, you know, to be able to point at stuff. Uh, and as long as they were up there, they figured they'd put a new instrument on, they'd fix a couple instruments, and they put this spectrograph on that was really, really sensitive in the ultraviolet and had really, really, really high resolution so that you could make out each of these individual transitions from these electro electrons and atoms in the intergalactic medium. And so our field just broke wide open in 2010, which was exactly the time when I got my PhD and was becoming a postdoc. And right away I got to work on this uh, cost uh, data, these cost spectra, and it was awesome. So I've been involved since then uh, in you know, several surveys of halo gas, of the circumgalactic medium and intergalactic medium. I'll tell you about one of them, but also I just wanna plug the UW work squad. Um, this is, I have a squad. Um, they're student quasar absorption diagnosticians. You know, I showed you all those patterns of absorption lines that you see. Every single student in my group, and now it has grown to 12 students, and I've done these students every single year that I've been here, they work as a group, and they literally go in these quasar spectra and identify every single line and associate it with a certain atom at a given redshift in front of the quasar. And it's awesome. We've been able to do really cool stuff associating this gas with galaxies nearby to it. So one, I think, of the big questions that we wanted to answer with this survey is, why are there two types of galaxies in the universe, right? This is a very kind of simple observation you can make. You look at images of galaxies in, say, the Hubble Deep Field. You're like, some of them are kind of elliptical and reddish, and some of them are spirals, and they look kind of blue, right? And this is generally really true in the universe where you make what are called these color magnitude diagrams. So you take the difference in two different filters on the y-axis versus some you know, magnitude or some luminosity or brightness. And they really, the galaxy population divides up. It's very dichotomous. It's like you're either forming stars or you're not. And you can see this over the course of the universe, like galaxies start dying as you get to the present day. In the past, they're forming stars really, really fast but galaxies are dying as we get to the present day. We wanna know why, right? And people think it might have something to do with the gas supply coming from the intergalactic medium and from the circumgalactic medium. So the first question we wanted to know is, is this dichotomy, right? These dual properties of galaxies, is it reflected? Can you see it in the CGM too, right? If you look at the halos of galaxies that are blue and forming stars, do they look different from the halos of galaxies that are not forming stars? And so that was the first experiment we did with this cosmic origin spectrograph. And so I'll just kind of walk you through some of the data. Um, so you've got an image here. You see this one little postage stamp that's not supposed to be impressive or pretty, but it is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The bright blue thing in the center is the quasar. That's what we're gonna take the spectrum of. That's the absorption spectrum on the lower part. And then you've also got a little galaxy. It looks like a little smudge here, but I assure you it's a real galaxy. You could take a beautiful picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. It'd be a tiny little spiral. That galaxy is at a redshift of 0.192, okay? And that quasar is at a much higher redshift. We can take a spectrum of that galaxy. This is what we do from the ground. And the galaxy itself is forming stars. It has a beautiful emission line spectrum. That big, bright emission line you see at about 7,800 angstroms there, that's H alpha. That's from the Balmer series of hydrogen, the strongest line in the optical of the hydrogen. And you measure those lines, you know exactly how far away from you the galaxy is. You know that it's redshift. And so you're like, all right, well, I've got a spectrum of that quasar. In the frame of that galaxy, that quasar, right, is probing its halo. So if you think about a line of sight, a skewer extending from that halo, it's going out into the halo of that galaxy. I'm labeling it, its distance is 87 kiloparsecs. I was just talking about parsecs as a unit, kiloparsecs, it's 
it's a huge distance, but the halo of a galaxy in total is usually like 300 kiloparsecs. So, you know, you're less than halfway out in the halo. And it's like, you know, all right, let's see what we find in that quasar spectrum. So now draw your attention to the lower screen there, and I'm going to advance the slides. First, I'm showing you H1215. That's Lyman alpha. So right at the exact velocity of the galaxy, but 87 kiloparsecs in the halo, I see hydrogen. That's Lyman alpha. I also see some silicon, some ionized silicon. I see doubly ionized silicon, silicon three. I see some ionized carbon. I see carbon three. I see nitrogen two. I see nitrogen three. Oxygen six. Oxygen, I told you, with my favorite. I see a ton of oxygen six. All right, so you can do this for a bunch of galaxies. And you can do this for galaxies that you know are forming stars and you know are not forming stars. And one of the coolest things that we discovered by doing this was that only the star forming galaxies have oxygen six. And this figure shows this to you. So on the y axis here, that's the strength of oxygen six. So if I go back to that absorption line, the strength is just kind of the area, like if you draw a straight line at one, the area under one there, that's the absorption strength, basically. That's what we call column density. It's measured in atoms per centimeter square. And so what you see, that's the strength of oxygen six. And then impact parameter is just how far out into the halo you are. So we go out to 200 kiloparsecs in this survey. But you can see every single star forming galaxy has a lot of oxygen six. The red galaxies, which are the red diamonds, have a lot less or no oxygen six as far as we can tell. If they're open diamonds, that just means we see noise. And so we just put upper limits on it. So this is stark, right? This dichotomy in galaxy properties of the stars and their disks was reflected by the gas in their halos. And so coming back to our original question, yes, the oxygen six might be some kind of signpost of what happens when galaxies are shutting down their star formation. And we're continuing to work on this. This is a really, I think, important result. It's well known. And we're really trying to understand the physics of why, because the other thing that I'll tell you that's crazy is that all of the galaxies, even the red ones, have hydrogen. And this is from the Lyman series lines, right? Hydrogen one, neutral hydrogen. You can see the red galaxies and the blue galaxies again. Look at them. They all have hydrogen. It's just that the red galaxies are missing oxygen six. And that tells us something very important about why galaxies shut down their star formation over time. And we think it's probably because that there's like a time offset there, but it's really reflecting how much gas is coming in at any given time from the intergalactic medium. So, all right, let's just sum up. Another important result from 2014 is that we can count up all the atoms that we see around galaxies. One of the problems in extragalactic astronomy is that, okay, we know that atomic matter is only like 17% of the matter in the universe, right? The rest is dark matter. But of that 17%, the stars and gas in the disk of the galaxy are only about 25% of what we know is there. We do these experiments with the cosmic microwave background. We know how many baryons, how many atoms in the universe, and they're not just in galaxies. They're missing. They right? call it the missing baryon problem. Well, we can now start to count up all the atoms in the halos of galaxies. I do some modeling in order to do this, in order to understand. But again, like I said, I'm just counting atoms in space, carbon and oxygen, and it all eventually has a mass. And what we come up with is the fact that there's no missing baryon problem. In fact, most of the material, the atoms in the universe, are outside of galaxies. And that baryons aren't missing if you account for all the stuff in their halos. And then the other thing is when we compare this with simulations, whoops, if you think about the fraction of the gas in the circumgalactic medium three billion years ago, that most of that, 60% of that, actually ends up back in the disk. That's that recycling that I was telling you about. It falls back down. And the fraction of stars that are forming in the disk, new stars forming in, say, a Milky Way galaxy that are forming from gas that came from outside of there, 80%. And so that is why I told you the takeaway is that while we are here right now, somewhere between six and nine billion years ago, 
about 80% of the atoms in this room and on this planet were out here. I think that's pretty cool. And uh, I hope you do too. And the other thing I just want to point out is that some people think about these vast scales in astronomy, the multitudes or whatever, and they, they feel really small. And they're like, oh, does any of it matter? But I think that it's really cool that the matter in the universe is continually evolving into all of these forms and that I'm a small part of it for the briefest period of time, I can actually perceive it and measure it. I feel like that's absolutely amazing. So I'm this self-aware substructure that has this brief window into the universe. And that makes me feel actually pretty, pretty important, pretty large. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. Thank you. So we, uh, we have a little over 10 minutes for questions. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start off with uh, on the chat. Uh, Steve Case, uh, he asks, uh, will they be using James Webb uh, for any of this research? That's such a good question. So James Webb is most sensitive to infrared wavelengths. So when I think of the spectrum of light and its energies, you know, ultraviolet's really energetic. But when you go to infrared, you're measuring things that are at lower energies. That said, you could measure UV, what were originally UV photons just from a much longer time ago. So at redshifts of about three, four, actually beyond four, you can start to look at the, say, the circumgalactic medium or the intergalactic medium at the very, very beginning of the universe at high redshifts. And so, yes, the short answer is they will be. What I was telling you about or nearby universe stuff with ultraviolet, but uh, James Webb will look back into the very early universe cosmic baryon cycle. Um, Super exciting. Any questions in here? Uh, so uh, if you have your spectrum of redshift it as it goes, as the light comes closer, mm -hmm. um, say a notch for um, light and alpha will be cut out Yep. Depending on what they find, it's like significant clumps of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Now you can give this talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, uh, is you know, are galaxies similar in make uh, all these galaxies? Uh, you know, they have such different visuals. They all look so different. Yeah. Um, but based on the scale of how big these galaxies are, are they all kind of made up of the same thing or? That uh, is also a good question. So the short answer is no. Galaxies come in a variety of shapes and sizes and chemical compositions. That said, to be a galaxy, right, you really just consist of some mass of material, like a dark matter halo, right, is the vast majority of it, some gravitational potential. And inside of it, you form some stars and there's some gas in there. That said, those stars can be in any given state of their evolution, can be a range of different masses. and for galaxies that form very early in the universe, probably you don't have a lot of metals, right? Because metals are formed in stars and they build up over time, right? But early in the universe, there's not a lot of metals. Stars form differently at times earlier in the universe. So yeah, there's a huge variety of galaxy properties. What I was showing you tonight was really just galaxies kind of like the Milky Way uh, in what we call the nearby universe or at very low redshift. So this is our current kind of picture of galaxies like our own in the universe but dwarf galaxies those little galaxies crazy galaxies that are merging with each other and interacting whew, that could be a whole different story uh, we got another chat question then we can um come back uh to the audience um let's see um is there is there a point where atoms will not be able to be recycled due to the expansion of the universe Wow, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so basically, ultimately in the universe, galaxies do age, right? The stars ultimately die and star formation will shut down. So if we were alive, you know, 10 billion years from now, not only will most of the stars be really old, low mass stars or white dwarfs and remnants, but it'll have used up all of its gas. So probably that'll be gone and also, the universe will have expanded so much more because not only are we expanding, but that expansion is accelerating. They won't get to interact with each other anymore. So they'll just kind of fade away in this really, I'm really glad to be alive now, let's just say. 
Uh, another question here. I'll go again. If you want to give me a second. Okay. Keith? I'm just a little confused about the perspective in the, in the third argument. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we can go back to that super long to try to get it. I see you as the user, but I think that in my head, what's stationary and what's moving? Yeah, yeah. So, right. So, okay. Basically, all it's doing is marching through time. So, if you imagine the quasar is really, really far away, this spectrum right here is when you're standing at the quasar. But as you move away from the quasar, right, you're coming back to kind of present day. Mm -hmm. So, it is kind of like moving backwards in some way. So, you could imagine I'm standing at the quasar and now I'm moving backwards, right? And that quasar light is getting red shifted. So that's kind of what I'm imagining. And then as you do that, moving, it's not like right. Going in front of the sun. No, no, no. Absolutely. Yes, okay. exactly. And in fact, when we observe it, we just look at it in its end state with everything there. But what's nice about this is it kind of shows you how it builds up over time. Okay, thank you. I yeah. Uh, I was wondering about uh, uh, dark matter to go to there and like uh, in. <sighs> Uh, I know there's dark matter and dark energy, and Oof, I, yeah. I can't uh, wrap my brain, brain around all that right now. But um, you said as you're looking through, uh, like, is this science also the science that helps us understand, like, just in general, what what that was it six percent or something like that? We know uh, what's out there. Oh and right. So yeah, I mean, it's actually closer. It's it's smaller than that, right? Like if you think about the total energy budget of the universe, the very vast majority is dark energy, and then there's dark matter, and then there's really just the stuff we know about, right? Like it's very, very small percentage. Um, so what helps us understand, there's a lot that helps us understand dark matter. This, I would say, is fully in the regime of baryonic physics or atomic, you know, physics. So unfortunately, no, not really. There are some like simulations you can do where you think certain types of dark matter, like we think dark matter is very cold, meaning it doesn't really interact with itself. But there are some models where maybe it does, it's called self-interacting dark matter, and it doesn't necessarily break all of cosmology when you change the properties of dark matter, but it does kind of change the baryonic physics. So you can do this in simulations and try to understand it, but observations aren't even close to there yet, I would say. Totally. Yeah. So a quasar is actually, so I said before, it's a supermassive black hole that's like rapidly accreting stuff and it's like jetting material out. And it does, it jets, it's this kind of bipolar jet. And it's actually a quasar is a phase where that jet is pointed right at us. <laughs> and so that's what I look at. There are supermassive black holes that are not oriented that way. Those are, they're called active galactic nuclei. And there's different flavors of active galactic nuclei. And a lot of that is depending on how it's tilted toward you. Yeah, yeah. I just don't look at them as much because they're not as bright in the UV often. But yeah. 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 Jessica, I assume that the work squad has a, a paper in preparation. Absolutely. They did this in uh, January of 2023. They so totally I, do. Can you tell us a little bit about the paper and mm -hmm. encourage members of the SAS? actually participate in the January 2023 AAS. Okay. Well, first of all, the January 2023 uh, AAS meeting um, will be great. And I definitely encourage um, people to go. I mean, I think I've been to those meetings that are huge. They can feel really overwhelming, but there's always like NASA shows up. They've got good swag. They give you like cool posters and t-shirts. And I often come away with like a tote bag and a USB drive. I don't know. They, they have cool stuff there. Um, there's beautiful posters and uh, there's a ton of people, not just astronomers milling around that want to share in their love of the universe. So work squad is working on right now. So we're wondering right now, we, we have a bunch of survey data where it doesn't matter what does the gas around galaxies look like? Does it depend on whether a galaxy is kind of alone in its neighborhood? or whether it has a lot of neighbors nearby, right? Do they kind of screw up the gas and how do they change the gas properties? And what's really interesting is that we're kind of finding that galaxies 
that have more neighbors around them tend to have more neutral hydrogen around them, H1, this Lyman alpha, that we see a lot stronger Lyman alpha for galaxies that are in denser neighborhoods. They're not like merging, they're not right on top of each other, but it kind of seems like there's more H1. And so we can learn a lot about um, how, how galaxy environments influence the gas around them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what was your name again? <clears throat> you know, you know. So when the gas rains back down on a galaxy, do we have like models yet of how they become like sort of gas clouds, like the one that formed our sun? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, that is such a good question. I feel like you should be a physicist. So there are theorists that fight over this at conferences. So I think right now we don't have a good model of this, but people are working on it and people will tell you that they have a model, but there's, there's a lot of different factors to consider. And one of them is like how the atoms are interacting with each other. Magnetic fields really screw you up. How turbulent the gas is kind of screws you up and you, it's really hard to constrain those things. So it's kind of like wild west. You can do whatever you want. Yes, that probably plays a role too. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's one. Um, uh, and then I was just curious about uh, that period of time when you graduated and the just by coincidence or I, I don't know that, well, that or not coincidence. It was a decision, but, but yeah. Decision, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But like, what, do you, were you anticipating that the science was going to open itself up at that time? In the, in, or do, were you planning on going about the science in a totally different way before the Hubble got upgraded? That's or? such a good question. So I try to take myself back to my graduating self. And honestly, like when you're a graduate student, you've just gotten your PhD, you apply for tons of jobs. You're like, what job is out there? I mean, in an astronomy, like there's not a ton of jobs, right? You're like, I just hope someone will hire me. Um, but you know, for what I, what I was doing as a graduate student was actually studying what are known as H2 regions. So ionized hydrogen regions around newly formed stars. So like those beautiful nebulae that I showed you, that's kind of what I studied as a graduate student. And those are emission line spectra, but I would count atoms in those and try to figure out what they were made of. And one of the things I found out when I was doing that is that you find metal like oxygen, like in H2 regions, these little nebulae that are really, really far from the centers of galaxies and that you can't really account for those metals getting there from other stars nearby. Like it has to come from kind of gas cycling in a hotter phase. And so I started to think about like these fountains and like recycling of material at that time. But honestly, like I got two job offers and one of them was working on, you know, a new survey with the Hubble Space Telescope Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. And I was like, that was in California. That seems pretty cool. I'm going to go there. <laughs> it was good. It worked out. It was nice. And um, we take a couple more questions. Maybe one more in here. Anybody have a. All right, one more. Hey, it's at two for two. Let's go. Okay. Um, on that slide that you had um they said like takes years on a supercomputer with that visualization oh, yeah illustrious that was like my one of my first uh, are those like galaxies and like the the gases like the filaments or like yeah yeah so um you kind of see like these filaments kind of intersect at a node uh you can't really see it on the screen there but um it's kind of like all those filaments are you saying there's little points of galaxy yes basically so these, these knots here, mm -hmm. these are galaxies. And you can kind of see where they come together. That's like a big galaxy cluster, a big cluster of galaxies right there. Yeah, isn't that cool? And the colors actually correspond to the gas kind of densities um, and, and temperatures. All right, I guess uh, I'll ask the, the, just the last question and then we'll wrap up here. But uh, yeah, like what's uh, uh, Professor uh, work? what's your, what excites you the most about what potential answers could be you could find in, in your lifetime in, in the work that you're doing now? So for me, I am actually the question that do you see your name was Dean Dina yeah. asked about how like what are the time scales? So you've got gas coming into the galaxy. I can see that there's gas coming into the galaxy. I can see what it's made of. 
but how it goes from just outside of the galaxy to forming new stars and what the time scales are, because right now we don't know if it's 100 million years or 2 million years, right? Um, I want to know what those time scales are and exactly the processes that are responsible for it forming those new stars. Like I want to be able to trace it on even smaller scales. And that's what I, that's what I really want to know. I also like, I really want to know, uh, this is why I'm excited for JWST because I've looked at the nearby universe, right? And what the gas looks like there, but I want to know what it's doing at high redshift. And I want to know what this evolution looks like in the gas compared to what's going on in the galaxies because i think that'll just be so that'll that'll help us understand galaxies in in such a new way well i know you're going to be competing for time for that one right yes <laughs> yes i know i can't wait well, we'll be in we'll be we'll join team uh team work uh work squad yeah, work squad yeah yeah well uh let me turn the lights on real quick as well. thank you so much for coming everyone i really yeah. appreciate it <laughs>